thank you so much for joining us for the inaugural Bondi Innovation Forum 2021, hosted live from the iconic Bondi Beach here at Icebergs, a spectacular day ahead of us. My name is Cathy levens byers and before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Bidjigal and the Gadigal people who traditionally occupy the Sydney coast and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and emerging. Today I will be assisting to facilitate the extraordinary lineup of speakers and subject matter experts as we embark on engaging in a rich discussion about how to attract and nurture innovation and consider ways to spread the benefits of innovation more broadly to the business community of Bondi and the eastern suburbs. Now, the Bondi Innovation Forum uh, was initiated as a key innovative project by our Mayor of Waverley and is brought to you by Waverley Council. Partners include the Bondi and Districts Chamber of Commerce and the Bondi Innovation Alliance. Now, if you've registered for today, you've very likely already scrutinised the forum program and speakers, so I will provide a very high-level overview view of how the day will roll out. From 9.30 a.m., we're going to start off with a macroeconomic outlook and listen to our host of visionaries, futurists and entrepreneurs as they talk about possibilities and what is possible and patterns on a global scale. We'll then take a short break for 10 minutes or so, just before 11 a.m. so our attendees can stretch our legs, uh, attend to that email. From 1 p.m. we'll be returning to explore the microeconomic outlook where some of our leading homegrown talent talk about their rise to success Success and their perseverance over the last year. A little bit of housekeeping as you settle in, a reminder that you can adjust your screen view to see both the speaker and the presentation as suits. And as we progress, you can access the chat function if you have a question for our presenters or a contribution, or if you require technical assistance. Subject to time, we will do our best to answer all of your questions. This forum is being recorded, and as part of your registration, you will be able to view it later. And to now formally open the forum and proceedings, would you please make very welcome Councillor Paula Massalas, Mayor of Waverley. Paula. Thank you, Cathy. And I must say, I am really, really thrilled to be here in, as we keep saying, the iconic Bondi Beach. And I, I must thank the Bondi Icebergs uh, for allowing us to be here today. Um, before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge the Bidjigal and Gadigal people uh, who traditionally occupied the Sydney coast and acknowledge uh, Aboriginal elders, uh, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which our guest speakers and participants reside. And I extend this respect uh, to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. As Cathy said, uh, today's forum is proudly brought to you by Waverley Council in partnership with the, uh, the Bondi and Districts Chamber of Com Commerce and, and I acknowledge Emmanuel Costandinu, who is the president who's with us today, and the Bondi Innovation Alliance. And I acknowledge Ross Dawson, who is the, uh, I think the founder and leader of the Alliance. So welcome. And it is such an honor to be in partnership with these two very special organizations. Now, this virtual live event is one of Council's key innovation projects for small to medium-sized businesses, innovators and visionaries. And it is absolutely wonderful that we're walking uh, together in partnership with our partners today and that we have a common shared vision. And today you will hear from a range of entrepreneurs who will share their advice, their insights and experiences about their journeys through creativity and innovation. And for me, you know, the, an understanding of creativity and innovation and the role that that plays is absolutely critical. You know, it's how we bring together people to actually exchange ideas, to actually, um, generate ideas, perhaps even dangerous ideas, and forge unconventional partnerships, because I think that's how innovation actually uh, thrives and grows um, and basically creates something new, vibrant and exciting. Now, businesses in Waverley have actually demonstrated that innovation extends beyond science, technology or research. 
encouraging how things can be done differently and implementing new creative solutions to a range of current and future challenges. And I'm sure that this will be evident throughout the day. And so on that basis, I really want to be able to congratulate our local innovators for being community champions in this space. I do have a very personal interest in innovation and knowledge, and I've ensured that knowledge and innovation is now one of the key priorities for council. And we have a process or a, or a, or a strategy called the Community Strategic Plan, where we actually plan what council is going to be prioritising and undertaking for the next four years and the next 11 years. And knowledge and innovation is one of those key planks. And we're actually going to be starting that process in June. And that is absolutely critical because what that actually means then is the council can actually develop a way forward to actually help and support our innovators in this space and what council can do to help and support that. And in fact, a couple of months ago, I actually um, moved a resolution to actually investigate uh, jobs for the 21st century within Waverley. And of course, innovation is a key plank of that. And that will create um, not only a plan for us for the future, but it will um, look at what else Waverley can do to support our innovators. Now, one of the, the wonderful things that we've actually um, uh, been able to identify is that the Waverley region actually boasts hundreds of new and established businesses, some of whom we've already seen to go on uh, and achieve fabulous success nationally and internationally. But we've also fortunate to have a growing group of specialised knowledge intensive independent contractors and small to medium sized businesses in the local area. And so council has actually been positioning our area to be a smart city of the future. And one of the wonderful projects that is very close to my heart is the restoration of the boot factory in Bondi Junction. It's a very old heritage listed building. It used to make um, boots uh, back in the 19th century. And we're going to be uh, repurposing this into a civic and innovation hub as a place of learning and a place of knowledge exchange. So at, at the forefront is council having a vision for a smarter, more connected community and local innovators such as yourselves are part of the community. And a key tenant of the strategy is how we actually empower our individuals and groups to interact, explore and experiment with new ways. So today's forum is about empowering innovators to interact and to exchange ideas. And we hope that the thinkers and entrepreneurs we've gathered for today's forum will inspire everyone. We truly believe in our region's potential to become a world-class region for innovation. And by joining us today, you are part of that journey into the future. So thank you to all the, the people who've made today possible, including our uh, economic development team. And good luck for today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing some fabulous outcomes. And without that, I will hand you back to Cathy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor of Waverley, Councillor Paula Masalos. Out into that beautiful, bright day you go. Much Thank things you. to do. Thank you. And thanks so much for uh, formally welcoming and uh, opening today's proceedings. Our next guest is uh, a key player in helping to realise today's forum. And I'd now like to welcome Ross Dawson, who is the founding chairman of the Bondi uh, Innovation Alliance and of the Advanced Human Technologies Group of Companies and co-founder of Futures of Art. More I can say about you later, but right now, Ross, welcome. This is absolutely wonderful. We have Bondi Innovation Forum happening, and I am such a deep believer in Bondi. I believe it's the best place on the planet. We are set in a global city, close to an international airport, the beautiful beach, a temperate climate, incredibly talented people, a wonderful community. And there was something missing, which was the innovation, the catalyzing of all these incredibly talented people to be able to create something more. So, 
I think we can look at today and think about before today and after today when we we'll come together with uh, Waverley Council, the vision of Paula and the, the Council coming together with the uh, Bonnet Chamber of Commerce and ourselves to be able to create an event which puts Bondi innovation and words which should be together and are together, that innovation and Bondi are coming together and, and working well. So this is, uh, so in terms of how do we actually uh, make this happen, and this uh, Bondi Innovation Alliance, you know, original vision was building Bondi region as a world-class innovation center. So it's Bondi Beach, Bondi Junction, and uh, the around, and all of this being a place where this is truly something where we can be a case study for uh, innovation regions, innovation precincts, ones which were attached to larger ecosystems such as Sydney. So at Bondi Innovation Alliance, first we've set up a uh, community, a website, where you can go, become members, connect to discover all of some of the other wonderful people who are in the Bondi region. And now we have launched Bondi Innovation Hub just freshly uh, launched. And this is a place where we can, a physical place where people can come together at Bondi Beach in order to be able to connect. This is the idea is to be able to create a community, a collaborative community, not just a place where people work out of, but where they can spark off ideas, they can collaborate, they can create things together, new ventures that would not be possible otherwise. And so we've just uh, set up a new plan. So we have now at hub.bondiinnovation.com.au. We have a site which lays out. So we have some resident plans. You can come in and be part of that community to collaborate, draw on other people's expertise. We can now uh, running a series of events. And uh, our venue is available for hire. And using this as a basis to build something bigger. And beyond that, our vision is we have an innovation precinct in Bondi Junction. We have a whole block with universities and research centers and centers of excellence to be able to create new possibilities. So I want to thank Waverley Council, their visionary mayor, Paula Masalos, and all of the other councillors who have supported uh, this, and all of the people, John and uh, Jessica, and all the people on the team who made that happen. Certainly, uh, Bondi Chamber of Commerce, uh, joint partners in this, uh, Emmanuel and Amy. And then in particular, the Bondi Innovation Alliance teams have been helping to put the energy in to make Bondi innovation happen, to come together as real words. So Julia Dominguez, uh, Charles Clapshaw, Nicole Mackay, and also uh, Nicola uh, Podesta, who put together the videos which you'll be seeing during the breaks. So by the way I always frame this is asking the question, what is the potential of innovation in Bondi? I haven't found anybody that doesn't believe that it's extraordinary, that it's amazing. And today at Bondi Innovation Forum, we're kicking off the real scope of that potential. So thank you for being part of this event. And from now, all we've got to do is just do what we have set out to do and make Bondi Region a world-class center for innovation, creativity, startups, ventures. It's going to be amazing. Thank you. Well, that's absolutely a great kickstart. That's, the, that's what we need, some energy to ride on for the rest of the day. Ross, thank you, and we will see you a little bit later on. Indeed. You spoke of uh, another partner, which, of course, is the Bondi um, uh, District's uh, Chamber of Commerce. So now I'd like to make welcome Emmanuel Constantino. He is not only uh, the president of the Bondi and District's Chamber of Commerce, you are also the managing director of Quick Copy Print and Design. And I certainly know you, as do many, as an enthusiastic collaborator, one of Bondi's best known, most passionate advocates for local startup and small business. And you tirelessly connect, support and represent business owners throughout your work with the Chamber. Welcome, and then you are. Thank you, Cathy, for that very warm welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to thank Waverley Council and the Bondi Innovation Alliance for partnering together and to host our inaugural Innovation Forum. Also, thank you to Icebergs for hosting us here, all here today and facilitating speakers that are also here today as well. We have had a vision for a while of evolving Bondi into an innovation hub and future leader. Today is the start at that and as we at the Bondi District Chamber of Commerce are excited to be the forefront of this incredible initiative. 
Presently, the Bondi District Chamber of Commerce represents more than 6,000 registered businesses with 12 different business categories in Bondi region, one of the largest business communities in Australia. Our geographic area encapsulates Bondi Junction, Bondi, Bondi Beach, Waverley, Bellevue Hill, Dover Heights, Tamarama and Queen's Park. Behind this, we have a team of volunteers, 12 that represent our board, who are strong, passionate business owners that would love to help the business community of Waverley. We act as the voice for the local businesses and we love hearing how businesses are evolving and growing how and how we can support them. Our goals are to help each business connect, educate, advocate and help them grow. Innovation is the heart of Bondi's survival. How many times have we pivoted in, in the last 12 months? I'm sure a lot have realised how much we've done and how much innovating opportunities we've had to re-engage and reimagine Waverley into the future. As the Chamber, we are always talking with businesses and activating ideas to help. As an example of this year, when COVID first hit, we launched, with, together with Waverley Council, the Keep It Local campaign. The aim was to find innovative ways to show locals which businesses were still operating and to always encourage people more now than ever before to shop local. We believe Bondi can lead the way and become a world-class hub for innovation. This year, we are launched our first scholarship program with Spark Change to support young leaders who are the future of business. We plan to work more closely with young entrepreneurs to reimagine our future. Again, we thank everyone for all their hard work in putting on today. A big thank you to John, Jess and Craig from the Economic Development Team and the Mayor of Waverley, Councillor Paula Marcellos. We look forward to being inspired today and hearing more incredible th uh, things from speakers, which we have, have actually really encouraged and really love to have them all be here today. We hope you enjoy, and if you'd like to ask anything at all about the Chamber, please don't hesitate to ask myself or anybody of the board. Thank you once again. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Thank Emmanuel. You. Uh, Enjoy the day. It is I'm beautiful. Sure you'll hang around and stay with us. I'm I sure I will. I, I, <laughs> I am. Thank you. All right. Thank you very All much. All the best. We're going to start now with our first presenter for the day. Uh, Murray Herbst from the University of Technology, Sydney, is uh, Director of Entrepreneurship. He says Australia's recovery needs job-ready graduates, productivity-boosting research, and new entrepreneurs spreading uh, innovations creating new jobs and driving our recovery. Murray's work is enabling this critical third pillar of work at UTS. Murray was also CEO at Fishburners, growing it from 100 desks of startup space to 750 across Sydney, Brisbane and Shanghai, and supporting 508 startups during this time. Uh, Murray is, uh, come and please join us. Murray is gonna to talk to us today about the future of possibility Right time, right place. Looks like you're at the right place at the right time, right here. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Murray. I'll leave you with it. Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, blaming my kids for something. Uh, so I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old, both of which kept me up for all of last night. Uh, I've got pneumonia. I broke a rib uh, from coughing. So I'm not. you're not getting 100% of Murray herps today. Uh, but it's going to take more than that to stop me from talking about entrepreneurship and the opportunity today. Uh, I'll also say you've got a wonderful day ahead of you. Uh, the speaker lineup, I have never seen a speaker lineup as good as what you're seeing today. This is incredible. So it doesn't matter how bad I am, it's going to get better from here. <laughs> I'll also point to uh, Kim Harris later today, uh, one of my favourite people and a big reason for the success of Fishburners as well. He's going to be incredible, as is everyone else as is Bondi. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to be here today talking to you. So, I'm Murray Herbst, uh, Director of Entrepreneurship for UTS. Uh, my origin story is uh, I was a bit of a nerdy kid. 
I liked playing with software. I liked writing software. Taught myself to write software. And I put a bit of software online that was an ad blocking product when I was 16. People started paying for it. It was terrible. It was a really bad uh, bit of work for a 16 year old. But when people are paying for something, you've got a reason to get better at doing it. So over the years, that got better and better. Over 14 years, that scaled to 100 million active users. Uh, and it was fun. Uh, anywhere I had a laptop, anywhere around the world, I could run this company. Uh, and it infected me with a love for this kind of technology-enabled entrepreneurship. Everything I've done since then has been things to help other people to have that kind of experience as well. So uh, when I was at Fishburners, there were 508 startups that started there in the three years I was there. Uh, I was CEO of Startup Muster uh, for a while. We looked at 5,000 startups across Australia in the time I was running that. At UTS, we've had 650 startups launched in the time that I've been there. So I have this love for technology-enabled entrepreneurship from my own experience and from what I've seen thousands of other people having as well. Uh, and I think that's a more interesting data point to talk about. So I'm not going to do the dictionary definition of entrepreneurship, uh, but I am going to talk about why I love entrepreneurship. And I will say, Macquarie Dictionary, if you're listening, uh, consider this definition instead of what you have, because uh, I like my definition better. Uh, for me, entrepreneurship is deciding what you work on for yourself instead of being told what to work on for someone else. It's not an unusual thing. In human history, it's not an unusual thing. This is the more normal way for us to work. We are in an unusual time where that feels a little bit less normal, and particularly in Australia with the kind of companies we have. But it is a normal way to work, and it's a wonderful way to work. You get to be your own boss. You get to set your own schedule. You get to work on technology that excites you. you get to solve problems that matter to you. you get to work how and where you want to, including wonderful places like Bondi. Uh, the most wonderful place uh, like Bondi. Uh, it's not hard to build a case for entrepreneurship, uh, but I will talk about why it's different today than how it used to be. It's different today because of the world that you live in and what technology is enabling. So there's two things. Technology is enabling Opportunity and capability. So remember those words, opportunity and capability. For the first time in human history, a person on a laptop in Bondi can reach customers anywhere in the world, can interact with them, can talk to them, uh, can charge them money, <laughs> can do everything a normal business does from that laptop. That is opportunity. For the first time in history, a person on that laptop can produce meaningful solutions for those people anywhere around the world and can distribute them instantly and at zero cost, effectively, to those people. This is unusual. Uh, think of a time in history when that was the case. It just wasn't. This is new. Uh, and it's continuing. It's increasing. This is your world. Uh, and so, great, you say. Wonderful opportunity, wonderful capability. It's up to you to go and do things with it, right? Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, but it is. Uh, I'll try a little thought experiment. Uh, imagine you live in a world where opportunity is infinite, and you can click one button and have access to all the customers you want access to. And capability was infinite, and you could click one button and produce whatever solution you want to produce. What would be the limiting factor in that future world? It would only be your initiative, your decision to do something about it and to seize that opportunity and use that capability to click those buttons. We're not there yet. It's a couple of clicks <laughs> still at the moment. But I'd say the limiting factor is still the same today. Uh, the limiting factor in this opportunity-rich and capability-rich environment is people's initiative, people's willingness to pursue these opportunities. So that's where we are already, even if we don't have that infinite opportunity and capability yet. I'm 100% confident in saying that. And the reason I am is, so when I was at Fishburners, that was all about attracting these kind of entrepreneurs, tech-enabled entrepreneurs. 
And that worked well. Uh, wonderful success stories came out of fish burners. The work at UTS has been a little bit different. It's been about encouraging people instead. So encouraging people to start, encouraging people to continue, connecting them to each other, connecting them to things that they need. We do have wonderful educational things, but that's not the focus of what I do. The focus is encouraging people to actually pursue what they can pursue. And it's working. Uh, I, was, I can admit this now. I was a little bit scared when we were starting out this, with an extreme version of what we were doing. And this idea that if you just encourage people to start and continue, they can do wonderful things. But they are. Uh, Fishburne has had the 508 startup start in three years. UTS has had 650 start in three years, less than three years. And they're incredible companies doing incredible things. So every day I'm seeing these kind of light bulb moments of people seeing someone like themselves doing something they can do and getting a result that they want to get and saying, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, these light bulb moments of people deciding, I'm going to work on this and I don't know how to do it, but I'll figure it out. And I think I'm able to do it today when I might not have been able to before. And if it doesn't work out, I'll learn something and I'll do something else instead. And these are life-changing moments. It's not a world where you're held back by who you are, what you have, where you are. It's a world where you're held back by what you decide to do instead. So I want you listening uh, and watching today to have a couple of realizations. Firstly, realize the opportunities you have today that no one in human history has had to address customers all around the world, provide solutions to them, learn from them, do everything a business does. Realize the capability you have today that no one has had in human history as well uh, that you can pursue from anywhere. Realize the limiting factor today is you deciding to actually do something about it. Uh, if you're not already, you should be. It may not be 100% of your time or focus, but it can be part. Uh, and it can expand. It's just that click, that moment of deciding that is the thing holding you back. And lastly, realize in this world, you can do this kind of thing from anywhere. So why not do it from somewhere nice, <laughs> somewhere safe, somewhere with a stable business environment, somewhere with smart people that have figured out Bondi is the place I'm going to be here. And you can do all those things in the way that I was doing and thousands of other people are doing and enjoy a wonderful quality of life as well. It sounds pretty good. Uh, I'll finish up by saying all of this change is obvious in retrospect uh, and it's, we're probably already there, but in future we're definitely going to be there. And we're going to realize we've gone through a massive shift where work is not like it used to be and it is now not something where transaction costs always require large companies to do anything. We are living in a world where that transaction cost is going away. And you watching this with your technology have everything you need to do something that wasn't possible before and do it from somewhere wonderful. Thanks very much. <laughs> That's a great advocate for Bondi and a beautiful beach <laughs> scene behind you. I'm moving in. Um, a couple of questions, um, if we have, have time. And first of all, thank you so much in, with all your ailments and difficult children for being here today. We Thanks, Audrey and Teddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, broad question, what does an Australian entrepreneur look like? Okay, wonderful question. They're different. People read books on entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley, or they look at Israel and Singapore and other environments and say, let's do things like that. Australian companies are different. We have different enablers here, different kind of industries here, different depth of capital, different expertise. I think people really need to pay attention to entrepreneurs in Australia and what they are doing, mm -hmm. and particularly recent entrepreneurs. Someone that did what I did 20 years ago is less relevant uh, to what people can do today than someone that's doing something over the last five years. So it's one big bit of advice I have for people is don't read books, yep. don't try and follow a methodology. Find an entrepreneur that you want to be like right. and try and get the real story out of them about 
the entrepreneurial confessions of what they actually did. Yep. I think I have time for one more very quick question for our next speaker. Um, what are the barriers to, to people pursuing entrepreneurship? And you said before in your presentation that um, sometimes something doesn't work out that you move on to the next. Hmm. I imagine that to a degree some self-resilience can often or, or, or the, the energy to keep going on can sometimes be a barrier. But I'll Definitely. Let you answer it. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. I like that. <laughs> no, ask and answer your own question. <laughs> And isn't it nice that we've just been through and are going through a pandemic and all the terrible things that are going on? I think if ever there was a time where we've had our resilience increased and our tolerance for taking on new things, it's now. Yeah. And I think a barrier that a lot of people have is their, just their perception of it, that they think this is a risky thing, that it's something for a certain persona of people, and that's just not the case. Yeah. Um, name me a safe career in 2021 for for yourselves or your kids or other people, what would you recommend they get into for a, a nice, safe kind of job for 30 years? Uh, good luck. That's um, a very profound closing statement. Yeah, uh, give it a shot. Okay. Murray, thank you very much. And please take care of your health <laughs> and keep up the good work. Thank you very All much. All right, fantastic. Our, uh, our next presenter, she is CEO of Singularity U Australia and also founder of Utopia X. And I am talking about uh, Christina Geretic Geret. I knew I was, I've been practicing Gera Kitty. That's very good. Oh, good. Well done. You, but, I, but I didn't get it when it, it mattered the most. No, that's okay. I've, I've answered to much less. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Christina, you're going to be talk to, uh, talking to us about concepts, thinking and mindset, uh, shifting impossible to a possible. Um, you are driven by design thinking, purpose, engagement and play. You have presented multiple keynotes and workshops for Singularity University COVID-19 Summit, the Australian Summit, the Global Summit, goes on and on and on. Also, the Women Leaders Digital Conference in Madrid. So clearly an advocate for innovation committees. Welcome, Christina, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Welcome. And what a perfect day, perfect setting, and congratulations to everybody involved. What an amazing event. So I'm going to talk to you about um, thinking and mindset, which are absolutely crucial in innovation. Uh, a little bit about where we come from at Singularity U Australia. We live at the intersection of the values of humanity with the value of technology. So everything we do has social impact. And for us, innovation should have that social bottom line, that social impact as well. The biggest question uh, that I think people face in this field of innovation and creativity is, what is innovation? Uh, and it's everything for us from incremental innovation, which are the improvements to processes and productions um, that happen in each organisation. Some diehards say that um, incremental innovation shouldn't get a look in. Uh, but for us, it, it's quite important. It goes through disruptive innovation, think about mobile phones, uh, think about the technologies that have changed our lives in the last 10 years, and destructive or radical innovation. And what you can see on the screen at the moment is the landing on Mars. Destructive radical innovation is where everything gets thrown out the window. So we have completely new ideas on technology, what it means to be social, what the economics are. So all this still needs to be uh, examined. So what is innovation? It's a trillion dollar question and it's a big industry. And of course, all innovations don't work and all innovations don't make it. So uh, on your screen at the moment is something that may have very much been ethically debated around uh, being produced. So this is a very personal innovation. So this is my dad's chair. Uh, and he wanted that blanket to stay on the chair. And my brilliant engineer's son decided that the best way to do this was to take his summer sandals and Velcro them on. This is a small innovation that, was, that works for him. The thing that is crucial in innovation is thinking. So what are the thinking processes? How do we go about thinking? How do we put ourselves in an innovation mindset? A lot of entrepreneurs, um, as you've just heard, will find a gap. They'll find somewhere they'll discover what we call a problem. And what you can see now is throat scope. So throat scope, Jennifer Holland, a wonderful, amazing woman, um, New South Wales, born, bred, um, came up with this wonderful idea, throat scope. And, she, and it happened. Uh, when she took her 18-month-old to the doctors. So she was eight months pregnant with her second child, 18-month-old, had throat issues, took the son to the, to the doctors. The doctor said, look, can you just hold him down? So she went, held him down, and the doctor shoved the, the 
tongue depressor that we're all used to and the light down the child's throat. And she's sitting there thinking there must be an easier way. She left that doctor's appointment, walked straight into a $2 shop, picked up a laser light, picked up a piece of perspex and a bit of tape, bound them together and went, that's going to be a much better process because it's a one-handed operation. What's happened in the years of development since then is they've now put much more technology behind it. There's a mobile phone app that goes with it. There's a mobile phone holder. You can take photos, send them off to a GP. But the other thing is it's growth and its uses are now exponential because it's being used by speech pathologists. It's being used to detect oral cancers um, by dentists. So it's multi-use all came from an idea that happened through necessity, which is where a lot of innovation comes from. These are what we say, uh, or what we consider to be some of the most important things in innovative thinking. So first principles thinking, absolutely crucial. Design thinking process is really important. User experience, absolute. Collaboration, you heard earlier from, um, from the mayor, I believe that collaboration is the thing that is going to take us forward and will do wonderful things uh, for Bondi and Waverley. Convergence of technologies, we're living in the land of convergence, we're living in an era of convergence and really important is that you set out to put a dent in the universe, whatever way that goes. An innovative mindset, absolutely crucial. This man, Neil Harbison, is one of nature's gentlemen. He has that antenna that you see on his forehead implanted into his skull. It was an innovative thought that he had, he's colour blind. And I actually had the pleasure of sitting down next to him at dinner one night and I said, why didn't you just go and get your sight corrected? Like, why have, why have this implant um, at your, at your, you know, in your head? And he said, well, why would I want to change my colour blindness? I see better at night. He said, I feel things much better. This device allows him to feel colour. So he feels colour. This next uh, little clip is... Um, an example of the convergence of technologies. So what you might be able to see in a minute is, um, is a whole system where we came up with, uh, in the United States, they come up with total immersion into augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, and the process, along with exoskeleton suits, so it's this convergence of different technologies actually allows quadriplegics, paraplegics to start having movement in their limbs. I'm a vegetarian. This is usually the colour of my diet. And it was quite remarkable at one point in time when I went to SU in California and I was presented with this. This is lab-grown meat. And I didn't try this lab-grown meat because I'm a vegetarian. This lab-grown meat, cellular-grown meat, is 10 times less damaging to the environment with water, 25% less arable land needs to be used, 25% less emissions are created. I didn't try it because I'm a vegetarian. And at that point in time, my daughter said to me, why didn't you try it? It fills, all, it ticks all the boxes. No animals were hurt. There was no damage to the environment. You still didn't try it. One of the things that we are really passionate about um, at SU is behind every innovation, we use the word humanivate. So the human being needs to be up front and centre behind every single innovation. What does that mean? that you always consider the consequences. So we go, okay, if we do this, what is the next consequence that happens? And then what potentially is the consequence after that? So it's not only about the innovation that we're putting forth into the world, but it's the effect, the flow on effect. And there's many case studies um, where there's many, many positive effects of, of innovation, but there's also been some negative follow on effects. It's really, really important for you to understand what you stand for in the process of innovation. What is the change that you want to see? What is the legacy that you are going to be so proud to leave your children and the ability to leave the world in a much better place than, what we, than how we found it? We talk a lot about moonshot thinking. Uh, and moonshot thinking is committing to solving a problem before you actually know how to do it. So how do you solve the problem before you actually know how to make it happen, but you know that's what you really need to do? Just want to play you a tiny little piece of uh, a, a video now that, is, that shows convergence of technology and shows the difference that innovation can make to the life of an individual. So this is Jessica Irwin you're about to see playing. She's got cerebral palsy. She's about to play in a 
situation with Steve Balby from Noiseworks and she's playing a program, an iPad with her eyes. Okay, so Jessica Irwin, absolutely remarkable. You can see her playing the, um, the iPad with her eyes. The program was written for her by Dr. Jordan Noyan, who is from Sydney. Amazing process, absolutely amazing. The ability of innovations to change lives when there is purpose. So thank you. I wish you an amazing day because you have a brilliant lineup of speakers in the perfect spot. Uh, you are enjoying the scenery and you are also enjoying it from, from wherever you are with whatever you want and in the company that you want. And I really encourage conversation, always conversation um, around the innovations. So thank you. That was fantastic, Christina. Uh, don't, don't go yet. Mm -hmm. I particularly um, appreciated how, how you made small thinking uh, actually innovation mm. um, and I do you think to a degree some people with the word innovation uh, entrepreneurs are potentially intimidated if it doesn't just involve tech yes and and innovation isn't just tech but tech can help scale innovations particularly uh, in 2021 mm. we use technology to help scale those innovations so that something that might be small that happens somewhere in the world can be globally scaled and can then affect a lot more people. So, but innovations can be incremental. I do believe, I'm a believer in incremental innovation. Yep. Anything that's gonna make life easier. Yep. And um, everything you're doing is uh, very much about human centric. You're talking about, think about the consequences first. Are you seeing a lot more corporate organizations and so forth that obviously you work with yes. embarking on this human centric focus? And the two parts to the question, do you think to a degree COVID-19 has accelerated that that greater awareness that, that it is all about how humans interact with, with money making and problem solving? innovative ideas. Yeah, I actually think we're on the precipice of great change. We're either going to tilt for not so good or we're going to tilt into complete good. Um, the Davis Manifesto at the World Economic Forum in 2020 actually said that if you are a major organisation and you're not putting humanity first, you don't have a social bottom line, you're not aligned to the sustainable development goals by the UN, you probably won't survive into the future. So we're very much seeing that. We're very much seeing organisations are not under threat want to change, but there's a, a whole lot of people out there buying with their conscience now as yeah. well. So, you know, are you environmentally consumer. sound? Yeah. And how do you, you know, how do you do mm. that? How do you ensure, but you don't just do it for the economic benefit. You do it because you passionately care mm. um, about what happens out there in the environment. Otherwise you're going to get caught out. Yep. So it's very much change, social change. I think COVID-19 has accelerated things. Mm. It had started before, but yeah. covid has accelerated so much and for all the tragedy, like you wouldn't want to wish it on anyone for all the tragedy, um, it actually has, if we look hard, although it's very hard to look hard at the moment when I've got colleagues in India suffering terribly, um, but there are lots of lessons that we can learn and I just hope that we learn them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, here's to that. Let's, um, let's make sure that if we're on that precipice, we go the right way. Absolutely. And thank you so much for your con contribution. Um, really great thinking, concept thinking and mindset and essentially shifting the impossible to possible. Thank you. Christina from Singularity U, thank you very much. We're going to introduce our next speaker now. Um, and just prior to that, a reminder to our attendees, please bring the questions in. I've got an iPad here where I can see the various questions that you might ask of speakers. So you just go to your chat box function. You may see a little drop down that says um, uh, put question here or answer here. That's just where you basically fill in your question in that little drop box. So that would be fantastic. And joining us now is Kim Harris from 2515. Hi, Kim. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. Kim, you started, uh, founded your first um, funded startup in 2002 and uh, you went on to work in and on with many startups ever since. You successfully built and exited two tech businesses before moving on to becoming founder and MD of one of Australia's first and most successful startup accelerators, Pushstart. 
from there, keep busy, don't you? You co-founded Australia's uh, leading startup studio, 2515. On the community side, you were an early director at Renown Co-working and digital uh, community space, Fish Burners. Um, founded the Sydney Tech and the Sydney FinTech startups, both of which now have thousands of members and were pivotal to the formation of their respective bodies. Well, I'm glad you've been keeping very busy. We appreciate it and innovating all along. Kim, I'm going to hand over um, that camera straight to you. Kim Harris, 2515, he's going to share with us thoughts on entrepreneurial thinking. Thank you. And um, yeah, maybe I should have made the introduction a bit shorter. Sorry, but I've been in and around startups for so long. And like most people who are presenting today, there's so much that we've all done to get us to where we are. So today, I'm going to be talking about thoughts on entrepreneurial thinking. I'm not going to be talking about how to do entrepreneurial thinking. What I want to do is actually just think about it a little bit more. And if we're going to be thinking about it, it's probably important that we talk about, you know, what do I actually mean by entrepreneurial in the context of entrepreneurial thinking? And for that, I like to go back to the actual French word entrepreneur. And, and entrepreneur means to undertake an activity. Now, what they don't mean when they, when they talk about entrepreneur is to undertake an activity like brushing your teeth, right? What they're actually talking about is something that has some degree of implied risk, right? Something like climbing Mount Everest, for instance, or starting your own tech startup. So risk is inherent and implied in the word entrepreneur. That's very important. And now there are lots of different types of entrepreneurs in the world. 98 odd percent of businesses in Australia are small businesses. And they're all, and they will all think of themselves as being entrepreneurial. But the type of entrepreneurial thinking I want to focus on and that the world seems um, really focused on at the moment is slightly different. It's higher risk. It's where there's product risk and market risk and there's a lot of unknowns. They're the tech-driven businesses, innovative businesses that are creating the future of industry and that's the type of entrepreneurial thinking I'm going to be talking about today. So why does it matter, right? Well, in 2011, 10 years ago, a man named Mark Anderson founded a company called Netscape. It's also one of the world's most um, prominent VCs, put together a piece. And in that he said, this is 10 years ago, software is eating the world. And what Anderson meant by that was every single business is becoming a software business. All industries are becoming software industries. And that the future of industry, the future of business, was all going to be software. And these, software, these new software businesses relied on new types of entrepreneurial thinking, the types that we've described before. And so that matters. Entrepreneurial thinking matters because it, it talks about what the future of industry is going to look like. But in Australia, it matters even more because we used to have this thing called the tyranny of distance in Australia, an event that we were far away from the rest of the world, and so we couldn't get a lot of things from overseas, and a lot of things wouldn't come in here. But what that meant was we had a lot of products and services created locally and consumed locally. Right? As the world progressed, software started to eat the world and digital distribution became the dominant form of distribution for a lot of products and services. That tyranny of distance disappeared. Now some people thought, great, we can get our products and services out to the rest of the world, but it hasn't happened like that at all. What's actually happened is we've become much greater consumers of stuff from overseas of other entrepreneurial thinking and the benefit has flown over, has flowed overseas. That benefit is revenue, it's taxes, it's employment, it's learnings about how to build these businesses. And so for us in Australia, if we're not careful, if we don't think more about how to do this type of entrepreneurial thinking, more and more of what we used to do is gonna go and the benefit of that is gonna go overseas and that's problematic. So, Entrepreneurial thinking matters, it implies risk, we need to do it. The problem is, and the bad news is, we're not really good at the risky side. So there was a study two years ago, and it said that Australians are among the most risk averse in the developed world. There are some fairly obvious reasons for why that's the case. All right, so it's not Hoppo, and it's not Bondi Beach. I don't know if you can see the beach, but it's not there. What it actually is, is what Bondi Beach stands for, right? It's a symbol of the quality of life that we have in Australia. 
And we're not a risky bunch, generally speaking, because there's no impetus to be risky, because we already have the end game. Excellent quality of life here. Right? It's kind of like the story of the Mexican fisherman, if you know about it. If not, look it up. The point is, we've already got it. Why risk it? But there are some other factors as well. The cost of living in Australia is quite high, so it makes sense to have a stable job. Um, we see a lot of people who have taken the benefit of, of taking on risky entrepreneurial thinking and who have built wealth out of that process. So while every day we run into successful lawyers or bankers or doctors, we don't really run into successful entrepreneurs or successful tech entrepreneurs. And what we definitely don't run into a lot are employees of successful tech companies who have become wealthy out of that process. So we just don't have a lot of direct inter interaction with that success, so it's still seen as a risk. The other thing is there's this cultural issue in Australia. I like to compare it to the US, right? So in Australia, we've been programmed from, very early array, from a very early age around this concept of fairness. It's the dominant construct in Australia. Our national anthem, Advance Australia Fair. If someone does something wrong to you, you go, fair go, mate. If someone's not doing well, we pull them up so they can get their fair share. And if they're doing too well, well, we pull them down. That's the tall poppy syndrome. In the US, though, there's a different dominant construct, and it's freedom. In their national anthem, it's land of the free. If there's a problem, they say, it's a free country. I can do whatever I want. And as part of that, they're also free to be as successful as they can be. So in Australia, another problem we have with risk is that culturally, we're programmed very early on that there's not a great benefit in taking on risk and accepting the associated reward. But listen, it's not terrible, right? We can overcome all of these things. And the way to probably think about how we might be able to overcome it is look at how they've done it well in other parts of the world and where else to look at except Silicon Valley. So let me give you a really brief history of Silicon Valley. See those eight men up there? I love this. They were called the traitorous eight. Right? They were working for a Nobel laureate, um, William Shockley. He, he, won the Nobel Prize for Physics. He built a semiconductor company in the 1950s on the East Coast where all the semiconductor activity was. Now, William Shockley was an awesome physicist, but he was a terrible people manager. And these eight people all packed up. They were brilliant um, engineers, scientists. They all packed up. They moved over to the west coast of the US to a place called San Jose where nothing really was happening. They created a company called Fairchild Semiconductor, and they actually created the world's first commercially viable integrated circuits. This is the 50s, where the whole world was dying for this type of technology. Right? There's a direct path from Fairchild Semiconductor and the Trader S8 to almost every single big tech company you know in the world. They started it all. Right? And the way it happened was they built their company, they grew rapidly, Employees saw that you could build a company rapidly. They spun out other companies. Fairchild worked with them. Fairchild created what was the first real Silicon Valley venture capitalist, one of the founders, created Kleiner Perkins, one of the, um, a very well-known venture capital company. And then due to their success and all of the success that was happening around Fairchild, there started to be this shift from something called managerial capitalism, which is big bureaucratic organizations that were running industry, to personal capitalism, which is the founder CEO model that we know today. It's Jeff Bezos, it's Bill Gates, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's all of these people. Now, personal capitalism started to take over. Everyone saw that from outside. They saw they could become wealthy, they could work on innovative things, and they, all these people started to come over to Silicon Valley. Now, there was a, there's a lady, her name is Margaret O'Mara. Two years ago, she wrote a book about Silicon Valley, how it started and the impact on the world. She coined a really interesting phrase called, she said it was an entrepreneurial Galapagos, right? And what she meant by that was Silicon Valley developed in isolation. It created this rare species of entrepreneur, of VC, of lawyer, of research institutions. Stanford's a great example. Stanford was just another university. And 
in the 50s and 60s, what they started to do was refocus all of their curriculum on building these steeples of excellence in specialised engineering, which is exactly what the world wanted then. They had all these organisations and, and institutions working together to build the type of businesses that were going to be the future of industry. And how did this happen though? Right? How did that start and then go on to become what we know today as the tech industry, the, the pinnacle of innovative thinking? Turns out it was government, and it was government funding due to the Cold War and the space race. Now, what the government did was, instead of saying, hey, we're going to do it all internally or we're going to hire consultants, they went out to industry and said, whoever can give us the best X, the best version of this thing we need, we'll give you a contract. So there was massive competition. And a great example today is SpaceX winning a $2.9 billion um, contract from NASA to spend, send rockets to the moon. Exactly the same. If you were good at what you did, you could count on very large government contracts and you could grow businesses rapidly. So government support, building these ecosystems. The good news is we're doing a lot of it here in Australia. We're a bit behind Silicon Valley, of course, but that's a time thing. But we're really starting to produce an environment and starting to produce companies and entrepreneurial thinking in Australia that can see us be well placed for the future of industry that Mark Anderson was talking about. But there's a question that not many people are asking. And the question is, do we actually want that? Right? There's this assumption that the current model of thinking, the risk, reward, personal capitalism, this model of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking is what we should be emulating in Australia. And there are a lot of people who are thinking it causes more problems in society than it actually create, um, helps. There's lots of different opinions on this. My feeling is that you can actually separate the creation of benefit through entrepreneurial thinking and the distribution of that benefit. Most people have an issue with the distribution. That's the wealth inequality. I think, though, there's definitely a need for the benefit from innovative thinking. It's 100% the future of industry. And if Australia wants to maintain our current standard of living, we need to be part of that future of industry. But the good news is, maybe we can be the black sheep. Because in Australia, we have, I mentioned it before, we have this egalitarian society. We have other thoughts around. We have excellent what they call Gini coefficients, which is the, the equality of income and wealth. So absolutely, we want innovative thinking and entrepreneurial thinking to be coming out of Australia. But what we might want to do is think about how we can put an Australian version of the distribution of that benefit out into the world, rather than copying exactly what's happened in the US and seeing the societal problems that's caused. So great, we've come full circle. We need entrepreneurial thinking in Australia. But how do we do it? So, there's this construct we have at 2515, and it's the art and craft of entrepreneurial thinking. We separate the two of them, but they're both important. The craft is the methodology, right? It's how you do this thing. And the methodologies have been coming out since Four Steps to the Epiphany, this seminal book, The Lean Startup. There's becoming much better knowledge out there about the methods you need to employ to build these types of high growth, innovative, tech-driven businesses. But it's the art side, the human side, that I think we really need to focus on. And what that's all about is the founders, right? No founders, no entrepreneurial thinking. No entre entrepreneurial thinking, no new businesses, no new industry. The founders are everything. And the art side is all about the creativity of those founders and how we promote creative thinking so for me, entrepreneurial thinking is creative thinking. Tech startups, high growth businesses are creative businesses. They're not tech or you know, commercial businesses. They rely on how, do you th how can we get people thinking or imagining a different future and thinking creatively about how they can actually make that happen when no one else has been able to do that. So creative, creativity is key. I'm not here to talk to you about creativity, but the good news is the next speaker, Remo, that's exactly what he's going to be talking about. So on to Remo. Well, one thing that you very much are talking about, I think, 
is, is collaboration, which yep. we touched on. And as you're chatting, I'm obviously thinking about the Bondi Innovation Hub that Charlotte Ross is you know, so behind. We had the mayor talking about the boot factory. So we're actually talking about a home, bricks and mortar, mm. where uh, innovators can come together. To what degree do you think mentoring is going to lift our game and lift our confidence in the global innovation landscape? So it's interesting you bring that up. The research shows there's very comprehensive research that shows to build the type of ecosystems we want, the key thing is density of entrepreneurial thinkers. Yeah, critical mass. That is it, right? You don't have to do anything else. You just need to put them near each other and let them do their thing. So the activities that are happening later, the innovation hub, the booth factory, all of these things are critical. Now, the other thing that, you, that normally takes time if you're doing it by yourself is experience and understanding hold on, what decisions should I make. Everything when you're a new entrepreneur is new to you. You're yeah. experiencing it the first time. So the role of mentors, mentors who have been through what you've been through and have a broad set of experiences is critical because it saves you time yeah. in that process. Yeah, um, which is a question that we've got. So starting a business is one thing, making it work is another. And how do young entrepreneurs, early entrepreneurs, how do they maintain resilience while they endure setbacks? So th this is the biggest challenge for any new business, the resilience piece, because most people, the issue is you never really know. This is the uncertainty and the risk that I was talking about that's unique to these new innovative businesses. For instance, if I set up a cafe, yeah. I know I'm going to sell coffees, I know I've got to put it somewhere where people come, I know how much I'm going to charge for it, and I know if people aren't buying it, there's something wrong. In these new types of businesses, you could be on the path to doing the right thing, but you just don't realise yet. So the biggest challenge is understanding how resilient you need to be. And in most cases, you can look back and say, yep, it was good that I powered through, or I shouldn't, I should have stopped earlier. The challenge is, the, the secret is, you have a vision, you're trying to bring something you care about into the world, and focusing on doing that tends to give you the resilience that will get you through in comparison to doing something that you don't really care about. Yes. So the, the secret is doing things that you care about, yes. and that will typically give you kind of more runway. So it almost comes back to authenticity. You, you were talking about um, America, free speech, uh, encouraging capitalism, and yes, culturally, we are somewhat different in Australia. Christine Garakiti, she was talking about um, human-centric, uh, really think about how your innovation, what are the consequences mm -hmm. on humans? So yes, th there's probably this sort of growth period for the for the culture of Australian innovators, if they find authenticity in their product and real purpose for it, does that give them a better chance of, well, you know, finding investors for a start? And, and, and sort of also, yeah, Australia finding its, its unique character and making that um, work for us as opposed to... Yep. I think rather, rather than looking for external things, what, what it does is... If you're working on something you care about, then you care about the people that will be the users or the consumers of that thing you're trying to build. And if you genuinely care about problems, yep. you're more likely to create the right solutions. If you do that, it attracts investors. If you do that, it attracts other people to work with you. So authenticity is absolutely necessary. You, the vast majority of people need to 100% be behind what they're trying to do. Now, the good, th the good thing is, because of our programming from very early on, the way we look at what happens after success is somewhat different to the way that they might look at it in other, in other entrepreneurial countries. But the real secret is, yeah, you, to do something you care about, to do it for people that you care about, and off the back of that, everything else flows naturally. They're, they're, the, they're the consequences of doing those things. Okay, one very, very quick um, question. You were talking about you have a coffee shop. It's quite clear to you. You're getting direct feedback. Are you selling coffee or not? What's your recommendation or suggestion to innovators out there? Where do they find feedback when they are starting to develop a new product? Talk to customers. Talk to customers. <laughs> Talk to potential customers. They might be the wrong customers. But 
this is the whole, I spoke about methodologies, right? Everything is based around this concept of go out and talk to people. Talk to them face to face, talk to them online, but you must go out and talk to the people who may be the consumers. This is, this is for most tech. For deep tech, you know, big, big, big challenges it might be slightly different. You might not even know who those consumers are. But the easiest way to find out what to do and to get the feedback is talk to your customers. Great advice. Kim Harris from 2515, thank you so much. No worries, thank you. That was most inspiring. And um, uh, another very inspiring speaker is going to join us now, Remo Jeffrey. Welcome. You may take a seat, you may stand, okay, people oh. do whatever they like. I'll sit down because I'm lazy. <clears throat> Uh, Remo is a creative strategist with a long track record as an entrepreneur, retail merchant and brand builder. He founded the Remo General Store, which I just love, mm -hmm. in 1988 and the General Thinking Network in 2001. Remo also enjoys a long and ongoing association with a TEDx organisation in New York. And since 2009, you've been licensee and director for TEDx Sydney, an annual um, a flagship TEDx event, which we all know very well, and very important to getting discussion up around um, leading innovation ideas. Fantastic to have you here, Remo. Great to be here. Um, I will let you present, and I'll see you at the yes. other side for a couple of questions. Okay, thanks a Thank lot. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Cathy said, my name is Remo Jufre. That's um, that's me when I was a little bit skinnier than I am now. Um, but um, and here is the homepage of my website, which kind of illustrates the portfolio life that I lead. I, I was born and raised in Sydney um, and I've lived here by the beach in Bondi um, for 30 or 40 years uh, actually and in fact I take a sauna and do my laps every day including today at the pool just behind us so uh, I feel very lucky and very at home here in this room actually. Um, a bit about me then, I'm a creative strategist um, and um, with a track record as an entrepreneur and a brand builder and a community builder um, and uh, the project I want to talk to you about today is TEDx Sydney but before that um, I founded the uh, Remo General Store uh, as Cathy mentioned in 1988 that's me in the front row holding a bathroom plunger my scepter my the symbolism of the functionality that the store was committed to that's me with my team um, way back then. Um, I also founded something called the General Thinking Network in um, 2001. Um, that's the Remo Corner uh, back in, I think, 1995. Uh, those of you who are old enough um, will probably recognise the brand there. Eerily familiar, hauntingly familiar, perhaps. Um, uh, still active today, um, online, based out of a garage, actually not far from here in Bondi, selling just a small range of organic Australian t-shirts and such. Um, I also, as mentioned in the introduction, I've, I've um, uh, enjoy a long association with TED, um, and uh, since 2009 I've been the uh, licensee for TEDx Sydney. Um, you know, there are 3,000 uh, active TEDx events, um, TEDx organisations uh, in the world, and uh, a handful of them are regarded by TED as being uh, quote unquote legacy, um, legacy events. And um, I'm proud to say that of them, uh, TEDx Sydney is regarded as the, as the leader and the gold standard. So I don't know how that happened, but it happened. Um, uh, here's a few photographs. That was from our 10-year legacy event in 2019 at the ICC Sydney with uh, 5,000 human beings there waving their arms around. Um, that was me uh, on the stage, I think, uh, the year before. Um, so that's what I've decided to uh, address today, and that is... Um, COVID-19 and how TEDx Sydney has responded to that threat. Um, but before, before moving on to that, just a little bit about the why and what of TEDx Sydney. So it's two things. It, it's a platform and it's a community. 
It's a um, its mission is to is to gather the local storytellers and creatives and the stories of innovation and to present a platform for those things to push them out to the rest of the world and to build a community around the shared uh, messaging and the values uh, implicit in the telling of those stories. Uh, the hundreds and hundreds of speakers uh, and videos that we've produced over the years have been seen by literally hundreds of millions of people around the world. So we feel that we're doing our bit to really tell the story of Australian creativity and innovation um, and push it out to the rest of the world. The, um, you know, the, core, the core purpose um, is to connect people and ideas. Um, there's another doodle which is a little bit clearer about um, TEDx Sydney being at that intersection of people and ideas. Um, so in 2019, we produced that book and gave it to all 5,000 of the attendees. It sort of documented and celebrated our journey from Carriage Works, where our flagship event um, was staged for the first few years to the Sydney Opera House, and then ultimately to ICC Sydney. Our creative partners also pulled together a video celebrating uh, those first uh, 10 years, and I think um, we should watch it together and it'll give you a good idea of kind of pre-COVID TEDx Sydney and what we, uh, what we entered 2020 um, behind, with, uh, behind us. So let's play that first video and I'll join you after that. Dear TED people. Uh, good morning, TED. There's no reason why we can't create a platform for Australian creativity and make that TEDx Sydney and make it an annual event. So here I am. Today has been a great event for Sydney. Knowledge is power. And as our world changes, so indeed do we. That exclusive TED experience. This has been really amazing. And you naturally come to the idea of a big bang. Thank you. Here we are in our new and happy home. Today's lunch is no ordinary meal. The idea of crowd farming was to ask everyone who came to TEDx Sydney to grow the food that we would eat on the day. Creating ideas that are truly worth eating. I'm sitting on this stage in this wheelchair and you are probably expecting me to inspire you. <laughs> right? I know that this is a TED talk, but now I'm going to TED sing. I would be a dreamer my dream. Welcome to the biggest TEDx Sydney of all time. Three simultaneous events at the Sydney Opera House. Why not? TEDx Sydney Youth is happening in the Joan Sutherland Theatre. This is a revolution in storytelling. Walking around a virtual version of me. Hello everybody and welcome to TEDx Sydney 2017 here in this fantastic venue. And this is a very big stage. We have the biggest audience that TEDx Sydney has ever had in one room. There are 5,000 humans right here. I love mathematics. Pie chart to love heart. It is the most viewed TEDx talk of all time. <laughs> welcome to TEDx Sydney 2019. My dear new friends. And it's 10 years for TEDx Sydney. It is an absolute milestone. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Music is an incredibly important part of what has been happening today. Thank you. When the rain is blowing yeah. in yeah. your face. Poverty is not natural. And the whole world is on your case. Thank you. I could offer you a warm embrace. There is no cure for my daughter. Make you feel my love. As his hand hovered over the detonation I switch. I could make you happy, make your dreams come true. There is nothing that I to the ends of the earth for you, to make you feel my love. Stand up for justice and never, ever give up. To make you feel my love. It's an organizational miracle and it's heartwarming. To make 
you feel my love. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that was TEDx in his first 10 years. Enjoyed that video, brought a tear to my eye. Um, then came COVID and this is what happened to our revenue. 2020 there fell off a cliff. Um, so when it hit, this is a doodle that I put together to explain to um, our registered attendees what was happening. Fortunately, we had pre-sold 2000 uh, tickets to our 5,000 seater physical event at the ICC Sydney. Initially what we did was um, postpone to later in the year, naively thinking that the air would be clear by then. Uh, ultimately we had to virtualize and um, so then what we had to do um, uh, was do a bit of refunding, mostly just to hardship cases. We couldn't have afforded to um, do much more than that without um, uh, frankly getting into all sorts of trouble ourselves. So I had to get the coloured pencils out, do some communicating to explain to people that, that our um, event revenue covered more than just event production costs, it actually covered our entire annual operating expenses for the year which weren't going to go, go away um, anytime soon. Um, most people uh, did not convert to a credit. They decided to stay the course and stick with us. Um, and so what we had to do was to take this adversity and turn it into something positive. And we had to dig deep and innovate, it, innovate and that's what we did on two fronts. Um, one, the development of a virtual platform that was going to be as rich as an experience as, as our live experience and secondly do something innovative in the actual um, studio from which we were producing the online event to um, to evoke that sense of um, community and liveness so here here are some uh, shots of the platform that we developed in collaboration with uh, registration partner Joma Blue that's the lobby uh, there's lots of stuff for people to do uh, including uh, get their photo taken in a virtual photo booth. We looked at everything that we did physically and just tried to do a virtual version of it. Um, we had main stage sessions programmed for, um, for the day, but in between those sessions we had um, a whole range of um, discovery sessions and workshops that were happening uh, virtually that the registered attendees, of which there were two or three thousand, could opt into. Um, uh, alumni speakers hosted some of them, zookeepers at Taronga Zoo hosted others of them. They were all happening live, uh, except a couple of them I think were pre-recorded. Each one of them required a, a production team. There were 27 of them in total over the course of the day. It was a pretty enormous production um, actually. Uh, the, when the session played, people could um, chat in real time on, on the right hand side with other members of the profiled community. They could, there was a reaction bar along the base that they could register their reaction in real time to what was happening on the main stage. If they saw someone who was interesting to them, they could reach out to them, connect with them, send them a message. Um, and in the breaks there were even uh, video tables where people could serendipitously just talk to other um, attendees in, uh, as you would on the coffee queue at, at the ICC or the Opera House. So uh, I think we did a pretty good job um, in uh, communicating, uh, in delivering a rich experience that was worthy of the TEDx Sydney brand. Um, that was the visualization um, of how we were going to address the studio, uh, where the speakers and performers uh, live, just as we are live today, uh, were going to be presenting their talks or performances. That's a 25 metre wall, um, uh, a Zoom audience that uh, was actually a different audience to the online audience because of the time delay. Uh, and that's how it ended up looking in real life. Um, uh, which is pretty close to the visualization. I'd like to um, 
I'd like to play uh, just a minute of this uh, screen movie from the platform, just to give you a sense of how that wall worked and how magically it made, uh, it interacted the well, virtual audience with and speakers and uh, presenters. So, so if we could just play a minute can, of that uh, video. We can live a, oh, look, look at them all lift up. They've, that's so funny, they've been patiently so I can talk over this one? sight yeah, good. all day. They've been um, drinking since nine. Because I can't see the video, I don't know what to talk about, but uh, this is an, um, an entertainer, uh, Catherine, um, who finished our uh, show at the end of the day, and here, here she is speaking to uh, the audience uh, who are manifest in this Zoom wall, and they're all over the world, and because she spent a year um, Sydney, Sydney, Canada. Zoom Is that Canada? Canada? She oh, was very, very good Canada. at engaging those people Our and it really made us feel with the investment in that uh, technology Hello, was justified. Central Coast, yes, in Wyoming. Let's let you watch a little bit more. Sydney, okay, that probably, that probably is enough. Um, so, all in all, it was very successful, garnered a lot of attention around the world. Uh, especially within the TED and TEDx community. Um, and that's always good when you uh, dig deep and do something and it's appreciated. Um, the, uh, the point of my talk then is that creativity actually craves constraint. And um, when you are hit by, by the bus that is COVID, um, then you have you have an option, you have, you, the option is either to kind of roll over uh, or just figure out how you can turn this threat into an opportunity to be more creative than you've been before. And the thing is this, the, the, the platform that we developed and the um, virtual studio audience uh, technologies that we developed uh, will now be used moving forward regardless of whether or not we're in a big room with a lot of people. Uh, so we, we are now um, staring down the barrel of a hybridized future. And um, we are now looking, you know, for 2021 at a hybrid version. Um, we're still not going to have a big audience. It's coming up in September 17th. It's at the Sydney Opera House. We're returning to that iconic venue, um, the little room, the studio. Um, but as you can see from this visualization, what we've done is taken what we um, had to do last year and we've voluntarily reintroduced it to this space. Um, and uh, this, I would like to leave you. That's really all I ha had to say. I just wanted to show you what we did with TEDx Sydney. Um, I'd like to leave you with a one, the one minute um, launch video for TEDx Sydney 21. 2021. Uh, if you're not already registered, please do so. I'd love, to, I'd love you to be there with us. Um, we're all going to have a great time. And uh, onward and upward into uh, the future. Uh, let's play that video and I'll see you at the other, at the other end of it. Stay with us. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Three simultaneous events at the Sydney Opera House. Why not? Welcome to the TEDx Sydney show. The purpose of TEDx Sydney is to nurture powerful ideas and to build a community. My dear new friends. In one room, there are 5,000 humans right here. Hello on our virtual wall. I want to know where everyone's from. Malaysia, hello. Mwah. Unbelievable things can and do happen. We share our passions, our dreams. And we can connect on that level. I love the study of life. We as humans are integrating more and more with the technology around us. The reason we are all here today, to connect. And we need to use wisdom to create the sustainable future for people and the planet. The power to do that is with all of us.
Thank you. Remo, we were just um, talking about Catherine Alcorn. Catherine Alcorn. Alcorn, yeah, yeah. who facilitated your, yeah. your massive TEDx screen. Yeah. And we all had to pivot so much uh, mm. during COVID, but you were saying that her facilitating ability with all, she'd just done so much work with the new technology that it made well, such a difference. I know, she had all the tricks that was the, okay, get a, get a piece of paper and write where you're from and then hold, hold it, it up. up to the screen. So then we had, you know, Arizona, Malaysia, yep. you know, that was kind of very nice. And it is with, with, with a lot of this, you know, with events going digital, is how do you keep that, that human engagement? Yep. How do you make people not get, you know, wander off and feed the dog or put out the washing or whatever they're doing at home while they're watching it? Yep. Um, speaking about engagement, you, you said that the majority of your registered ticket holders actually maintained their credit yeah. Uh, when you weren't able to go live with the last mm. TEDx. That's got to say a lot about loyalty, mm. which also, I guess, brings us back to a theme that seems to be coming up this morning, authenticity. Yeah. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on that? Like, um, how, do you, how do you keep your customers coming back and yeah. being loyal? What builds brand loyalty? I've thought a lot about this over the years. Um, but well, uh, I think you need, uh, you know, you need a purpose... First of all, you need a personal why, like why are you doing it personally? And, and that then translates to an organizational why. And you need to communicate context and purpose to your customers. Where do they fit within the larger picture and why does the larger picture matter to anybody at all? So with the Remo General Store, with the General Thinking Network, with the TEDx Sydney community, it's, for me, it's always been about um, constantly revisiting that organizational why, mm -hmm. but then more importantly, communicating that with an authentic voice. Yep. Uh, because that, as a, as a leader, that's really what I see to be my main job. Yep, yep. You know? Which, which are, you may have answered the other question that we've um, come in. There's a comment, you've got a track record for building organisations and creating brands that cut through and inspire great loyalty, which is mm. what we were talking about. Um, and what do you put that down to? It sounds like it's review, revisit, respond. Is yeah. it that type of approach? There is a line um, there in terms of honesty and authenticity and full disclosure, I'm always stepping over it and my team is always pulling me back saying, you can't say that, you can't show them that, you can't tell them that. And I said, well, why not? You know, like, yeah. or why not? Um, Bring them on the journey. Why, why not uh, show them under the hood? Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, it, if I had my duthers, uh, uh, there would be more warts and more all. Yeah. In, in the comms, yep. um, but, uh, but, I, but I have enough influence still uh, to be able to make sure that where, where possible, we just always just tell the truth and tell it as like it is. And frankly, if, if, um, if we hadn't had that retained uh, registered uh, audience from last year, we would have had to fold the tent. You know, it was like there Absolutely. was no, there was no. Um, I'm only got about thirty seconds left. Hybrid events, yeah. where, where, you just, just throw it out there. Where do you think we'll, we'll be in two years with regards to live and uh, digital events? Well, hopefully, we'll be back in a big room with a lot of people. But what I was trying to say before was that I don't want to lose that audience from Salt Lake no. City and Malaysia and. So I, we need to figure out a not non-distracting, elegant way to have that um, remote audience yep. engaged in the live event. And frankly, we're, we're going to need as many revenue streams as we can get. And one of them is going to be through um, the online platform. Yep. So we're not going to let that wither on the vine. No. We're going to... So it's... Um, it's maximising um, everything and firing on all cylinders yep. and, um, and turning on a dime if required. If yep. someone, you know, someone gets sick uh, in a nightclub in Crow's Nest, we life need goes. to... We, we, life, exactly. Life, has got life, to go life on. goes... Exactly. Mm. Well, creativity craves constraint. I think they're three... Very powerful words three, put three together. Three C words, yes. That's it, the three C words put together, and you heard it here first. I wish I could get everyone to get their hands together in a big round of applause. Mm. But Remo, Remo, thank um, you very much. Jeffrey, uh, very much uh, enjoyed being here. Yeah, we really love having you here. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay.
So as uh, Remo Jeffrey heads uh, back out there to maybe have another swim and another sauna in his, uh, his regular Bondi icebergs, I'd like to invite back to join us Ross Dawson, um, who uh, you, you obviously um, helped to open our forum this morning from the Bondi Innovation Alliance. Ross, you're going to be talking to us about the shifting business and uh, work landscape. Now, if you have just joined us, a little bit about Ross. He is globally recognised as a futurist, an entrepreneur, a keynote speaker, and an authority on innovation and strategy. And I have been listening to your keynotes over the years, and you certainly have been at the forefront of this topic for a long, long time. He is the founding chairman of the uh, Advanced Human Technologies Group of Companies and also the Bondi Innovation Alliance and co-founder of Futures of Art. A strong global demand has seen Ross speak about the future to business and government leaders in over 30 countries across six continents. And now you can do it from the luxury of your lounge room as well, can't you? Um, you are a best-selling author of four books, including The Prescient Living Networks, which the New York Times has uh, credited with predicting the social networking revolution. There is much, much more, but I'm going to let Ross tell you all about it. Thanks for coming back to the camera. Thank you. So the shifting world of work and uh, business, and I think you might have noticed that the world is changing very fast. Uh, at the beginning of last year, 2020, I was saying, people ain't seen nothing yet. This decade is going to be have more extraordinary change than we could ever imagine. But I didn't uh, foresee quite how fast the change would be, even in 2020. Now, the people are talking now about, all right, when's things going to be back, or what is the new normal? There is no normal. There is, it is going to continue to be changing so fast. Yes, we may be starting to get beyond this particular pandemic, but the nature of who we are and how we live as a society is fundamentally changing at a pace that we can barely comprehend. So two critical issues here. One is the future of business. The, and the business is essentially how do we create value? Money is just a mechanism for that, but is how do we create value for ourselves and others? And work is at the very heart of the future of humanity. It is who we are. It is our role in society. It is what is we contribute. It is how we further ourselves. So if we think about this, at the very heart of change is our identity, who we are. Now that is fundamentally changing as technology is shaping who we are, as we are starting to see, for example, in this uh, video, you can see that there are some robots and there are some humans. And you, if you can tell, look closely, you can try to work out which one is which. Now, this is an illustration of the increasing capabilities of machines and the blurring boundaries between human capabilities and machine capabilities. So now this is, comes to a point where we are using technologies not just to be able to support ourselves, potentially in some places to do the functions which you've done, but also to augment ourselves, to use technologies to change who we are, to use cognitive offloading, to put part of our thinking into machines, to use biotechnology to change who we are. So as our identity shifts, that is a fundamental nature of where the business fundamentally changes. So at the heart of this is a changing structure for business for value and how it is created. And at the, um, what we've seen from there is that the whole world is based on networks. Uh, the internet, of course, is a network. It is a network of connections out of which we are starting to, uh, ideas flow, value flows, we are getting new configurations of value and network science over the last couple of decades have discovered that in fact it's not just uh, the technologies of networks but also in terms of society, organizations, and in fact our underlying biology is driven by networks at the heart. So we live in an intensely networked society and economy. And at the heart of that is platforms. So platforms are a way, a mechanism whereby we create value from in, within these network structures. Now, if we think about what the definition of a platform is, it is where people can allow others to connect so they can create value directly. 
And so we have some structures to support that. We have mechanisms to be able to uh, support those behaviors. And this is, uh, this is then a provide you know, a fundamentally different way of doing business. Instead of creating products and services and selling them, you are allowing other people to connect in order to be able to create value. So if we if you see this, uh, you can see this slide, which is a little complex, but just sort of just start at the bottom of this. There are a whole array of different platforms that enable us. We have technology standards. We have some various technology platforms and social media, of course. And what we've t traditionally thought of is the platform as a business model. Your Ubers and your Airbnbs and your Netflix and uh, so on. But it's not just about these companies. Now we're starting to see, indeed, organizations are uh, starting to set up themselves as a platform to be able to build things. We're starting to see that cities, uh, such as Sydney, such as Silicon Valley, such as Singapore, and potentially in Bondi as well, being as platforms to enable people to connect, to create value together. And so this is now the frame that we have for value creation is not creating and selling products and services, but enabling people to connect to create value for themselves and the way in which they work. So if we think now around how value is created and the role of work, what is, it, what is the nature of work in this world? And so the part of that is we need to think about what are the fundamental human capabilities that we have. So in a world of technology, so we are connected. So that changes the nature of uh, the work can be done anywhere. So I have in my organizations people working in Bondi and many people working around the world. That is the way in which most organizations work today. We also have automation, which is taking away part of the roles of humans in their work. And so if we think about the three fundamental roles, the three fundamental human capabilities, which are expertise, creativity, and relationships. And the intersection of those, the way those all come together, is, the, is essentially defines our future as humans in the, the, uh, the world is coming in the role of work. So this, this means that all value is based on collaboration. So this is a way if we think about, you know, what is an organization? An organization exists because you've got people together who are co collaborating, creating value together. Now we're seeing organizations extend their boundaries. They have people working externally. We have open innovation. We're starting to see these collaborative ecosystems. Back in my book, Living Network, I said that the business is no longer about creating value inside an organization. It's about creating ecosystems of value and then taking an appropriate portion from you. All value is created collaboratively. And that changes the nature of what an organization is, whether it's a startup, whether it's the biggest company in Australia or the world, is it, whether it's a government organization, whether it's an ecosystem of startup people. This is all about how it is we structure the collaboration and we're creating the platforms that enable these ways of working. So if we think about the, you know, the local networks and the global networks, you know, this image showing our tech startups group at uh, Bondi Innovation, all of these people have global connections. Some of them have just come back from Silicon Valley where they've been working for Uber and Airbnb and are now bringing their expertise, their connections to Silicon Valley into Bondi to be able to connect. So when I gave the keynote at the uh, National Economic Development conference a couple of years ago, the theme was that in order to develop the economies of regions, you must build local networks, as we heard from uh, Kim in particular earlier, and Murray, it's around how do we create these connections between all of the wonderful people here to be able to grow talent, and how do we reinforce and support and connect into the global networks, the amazing people who are in France, for example, for our big French community in Bondi, or in uh, Silicon Valley, or there's many people coming back from New York and London in extraordinarily high-powered roles who are coming back in order to be part of these connections. So we can use the local networks and the global networks in order to be able to create value together. 
So I think the, you know, rounding out, I mean, we need to think about the law of requisite variety. And that tells us that as individuals and organizations, we can only achieve what it is we want to achieve if we are as flexible as our environment. And I think we've seen, a, as I said, a pretty fast pace of change, a lot of di a very dynamic world out there. So it is our roles not just to be flexible and adaptable and uh, innovative as individuals, but the organizational forms that we create, be they startups or larger organizations or the nature of governments, must be as flexible, as adaptable, as innovative in order to be able to create the prosperous future of business and works that we have the opportunity to create right now. And so uh, my vision and hope is that Bondi region becomes a case study for how we can bring together those local networks and global networks to create this future of business and work. Well, I'm inspired. I just, there we go. One applause, at least. Everyone out there is doing that as well. Ross, that's, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, building up the local, um, not versus global but really it's about building the local so that we can really connect globally. And again, that, as you referenced before, is the theme of some of our previous speakers. Um, we are at such a, a tipping point in the world, as, as we know, and many people, in particular young people, are pointing to a very scary, unknown future of work. To what part can innovation play to help um, solve that soothe those concerns, change that scary landscape of employment moving forward? I perhaps reframe that in that the pace of change is extraordinary. And as we heard earlier, yeah, you can't plan on a 30 year career today. That's no. meaningless. Well, who knows what the world's going to be like in 30 years. Mm. So it comes back to ourselves as, so there's a few layers to this. And part of this is creating a prosperous future of work. There are, there's many people who believe that the future of work is going to be horrifying. That the machines are going to take over and there are not going to be any jobs anymore and there will be massive unemployment. But there's also many people, including myself, who believe that we can, if we do the right things, create an extraordinarily positive future for work where people's human potential is enabled through the work that we create and together we're creating an incredible, uh, better world than we've ever had before. So there's a three layers, I think, to do that. One is individuals. We need to take responsibility for understanding that we need to keep on growing. We need to keep on learning. We need to be able to keep on trying things, to experimenting, as Kim was uh, alluding to. Uh, our educational institutions, mm. of course, need to evolve. And uh, that's a whole other uh, conversation. I was going to touch <laughs> on that, but yes, yeah, so is uh, the education system keeping up? Well, no, of course it isn't. And, um, and so, the, so the question is, what is it we can do? Okay, recognize, yes, our educational system at all layers is far behind where it needs to be. So the, the issue is, all right, well, what is it that we can do today in order yeah. to be able to bring education up? And part of it is not just changing primary, secondary, tertiary education, but also being able to complement that with other ways in which we learn together. But the other issue on creating that prosperous future work is essentially around the large organizations, which is corporate employers and government, to be able to frame, this is not about, for example, how do we get AI to replace people, but how do we design work and design organizations so that we can use the extraordinary capabilities of humans within a system which includes technology. And back to the point I was making earlier about identity, we are, not, we are fused with technology. Whenever we use a spreadsheet, we are becoming symbiotic with computers. So find, finding efficiencies, digital efficiencies, is not necessarily going to make a human obsolete. Well, no, but I mean, that, but even thinking about the efficiencies is not the point. Yep. The thing is, how can we create the most value possible? How do we use humans and machines together in a system to be able to create that? Yep. So in a way, you need to forget where you are now and envisage what that organization of the future could look like, should look like, and then create it. Move from where you are to where you could be. As you say, the shifting business and work landscape, it's, it's really can be what you imagine. 
Well, it's collectively. Yes. And so individually, yes, we can do that. But this is something where we collectively need to be envisioning yeah. that prosperous future of work yeah. and business and to be collaborating, working together to be able to and fulfill our intent yeah. Yeah. of that positive yeah. future. Well, uh, it's fantastic that the Bondi Innovation Hub, um, and I see on that website that there's the opportunity for people to, to sign up, become a member, obviously remain informed. So obviously a passion project there, but really about uh, extending the collaboration opportunities and the network far and wide. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. sort of those points of the local networks and the global networks yeah. that we're making, that's absolutely the vision. Extraordinary local networks. We're willing to connect all of these and absolutely inspiring, talented people that are, are drawn to Bondi by the, by the uh, what we have here. Yep. And drawing on the extraordinary international connections of the people who are here to be able to create something amazing. Now we know we have some questions that have come in and I'm just using my innovation here to work out how to find them. <laughs> uh, just hand it over to, to you, Ross. Um, or perhaps, John, you could just whisper them in my ear or just... Uh, first one is, yep. um, how do we ensure that we have a community where housing, food and jobs are more affordable and plentiful? Um, I will just repeat that for the cameras. How do we ensure we have a community where affordable housing yes. and food... Uh, Housing, food, and jobs uh, are affordable. Are affordable. Uh, well, I not only don't have a snappy answer to that, mm. I don't have a complete answer. And so, mm. the, but these are the challenges which we have to grapple with. Yeah. So these are the fundamental questions. And in a way, posing the question moves us closer to the answer. And if we don't answer that, ask that question, we're not going to be able to get to the answer. So I could, you know, spend a long time trying to answer that question. But I think the critical thing is that that is the question that we need to be focusing on collectively. The housing affordability is a critical issue in Australia mm. in terms of being able to get access to jobs. There are many, still many unemployed people or, or vastly underemployed people, mm. not just in terms of you know, their pay, but also in terms of using their full capabilities. Mm -hmm. So these are, I, you know, without trying to answer that full question because it is, it's you know, not something you can answer quickly. These are the questions we must be asking and engaging with. Mm, and they are. They're, 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 they hurt your head, but we've got to talk it out and work through it and find solutions. Another question. The future of Australia and globalisation and jobs post-COVID, which is perhaps a statement more than a, more than a question and not one that we expect you to have all the answers to, um, but what's your thoughts on, and it's probably similar to what you've spoken about, we need to collaborate, we, we, we need to interrogate, we need to put the brains trust together to try and find solutions that can be piloted. Well, out. I think to uh, particularly what Murray uh, was saying earlier, uh, we have to recognize as a society where value is being created. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, of course, a role for government and society to recognize that innovation in the broader sense, including in, which is you know, not just technology, but in terms of what it is that we use, you know, where new ideas, technologies, ways of thinking, ways of working. And that is where value is clearly being created in just about every economy in the world, Australia, has done not bad, let's say, but this has to be the focus of society in terms of their education, in terms of government support, in terms of being able to say, we are a truly an innovation nation. And there's, I think there's plenty of politicians that use the word innovation and don't do anything to support that. Mm -hmm. But that creating of the new has to be fundamental. So, and again, there's this question for Australia's future, mm -hmm. is the degree to which we embrace what it is we have the capabilities to yeah. do you know, as represented by, you know, Murray's ecosystems and Kim's ecosystems and Re Remo's audience and so on to be able to uh, create that. Yep. Well, it's fantastic. You've created a hub that everybody can come together and, and exchange on that. Uh, Ross, thank you very, very much for not only um, your, your opening speech, but also obviously your presentation and for helping to pull this all together. We really appreciate it's it. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, go forth and please, keep, no doubt, keep in innovating. You certainly will. That, that's clear. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a short break. and uh, But as we do, we are going to actually pop a poll up on the screen. And what we would love to know from you is what city 
are you watching us from? And I think you might be able to pop your postcode in. So even if you're in a, a suburb, not in the eastern suburbs, but in New South Wales, we'd, we'd love to know where that is. Or if you are tuning in from elsewhere around the world. So what city are you watching us from? And what industry are you currently working in? Now, you will need to uh, go into the little chat box section or the, the, the drop down and actually type in uh, those answers. Uh, so it should make should make uh, good sense to you, I would hope. Uh, there's a, a little submit questions through the box and if you type your answer in there, that would be great. So um, we'll uh, have the results of that poll when we come back, but uh, we're just going to put on a little bit of uh, background music and some beautiful images of, of Bondi. Take a short break, allow you to some, check some emails and stretch your legs, and we will see you back here at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, New South Wales. Thanks very much, everyone. See you soon. My venture is an organisation called Red Earth, uh, which gives traditional owners living in remote homelands and communities in remote Australia the tools they need to host groups of young people on their land and on their own terms. And the other side of that same coin is that it gives uh, high school groups the opportunities to travel to these areas and learn about the world's oldest ongoing culture. I came to see the opportunity when I travelled up to Cape York about 10 years ago and during my time there I met elders and traditional owners uh, who really lamented the fact that young people were spending time going overseas and not discovering uh, their own culture uh, right here in our own backyards and they really wanted to be able to host groups of young people and teach them uh, about their way of life on their own land. I think the biggest success has been to see uh, the growth in uh, our partner homelands and our partner schools, uh, but especially with the traditional owners and their families, seeing the pride that they have in welcoming uh, young people and seeing them grow in their confidence uh, in talking about their culture and showing them their way of life. That, that's really been what's, what's been most special for me. Uh, my ambitions for the coming years are, are to really expand and give any traditional owner living in remote Australia uh, the chance, if they so want it, uh, to host groups of people on their land, whether that be uh, young people in school groups or corporate groups or other groups of adults, and to really serve as uh, a bridge to connect uh, non-Indigenous Australia and Indigenous Australia. The potential for having an innovation community in Bondi Beach uh, is really great. There's a culture of entrepreneurship uh, that, that I think isn't fully tapped and you just have to walk around and, and see the cafes full with people working on their laptops uh, to realise that there's a real desire of people to, to run their own companies and, and to really uh, create products or services that can make a difference in Australia and in the wider world. And I, I think that, that really is innovation. I think Bondi will become an amazing place uh, to launch ventures and, and to grow ventures uh, when it manages to combine uh, the spirit that's already there of entrepreneurship of the people that are there together with the mentorship, mentorship that is required to bring ventures into the light and to grow them and the capital that they need um, to, to grow and to scale to become financially viable. So when you bring those three elements together in one place, you tend to have uh, an area that's really ripe for uh, being able to launch ventures that are successful. It's called Buddy Fitness and simply it's a marketplace for fitness professionals. So someone can search, book and pay for qualified fitness professionals in their area. I'd say the biggest one is getting our idea out into the app store. It had a lot of challenges and my co-founder and I have never put an app in the app store before. So it was a huge learning curve, but I think that's our biggest success. The biggest one is taking what we've built and adding to it to implement a lot of uh, data hubs around both
most sides of the marketplace, which is a, a big piece, but that's where we really want to take it, and of course, outside of Australia into the US and Canadian markets. I chose Bondi because you get the best of both worlds. There's the beach and the city all within 20 minutes, so that's why I'm still here 10 years later. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of talented individuals here, a lot of successful startups. Uh, it's a beautiful place to live, so it attracts a certain quality of person who's driven and motivated and usually a self-starter. So I think there's lots of opportunity for some good incubation to happen. I think increasing communication and awareness is one. It's definitely a beach vibe town. Lots of events happening around surfing, so getting a few more events out there into the public around innovation and connecting the right people, I think is really important and will definitely incubate great ideas. is 33 Bondi and we're an innovation team that we work remotely. We used to be in this space and now we work all over Sydney uh, and we do a lot of marketing and technology, so building uh, business solutions, applications that help acquire customers and nurture them to deliver great experiences and business value. The biggest successes for 33 Bondi in the last 12 months would have to be the uh, build that we did for our pharmacy client, Blooms the Chemist. We built their first online store, their e-commerce store, and it's quite amazing because it works across 100 stores uh, and online obviously does things like understand their rewards and customer loyalty data. It allows people to click and collect with the whole back end, the ERP and the rewards and the enterprise and the front end. So yeah, definitely we got, we got the uh, Big Commerce Asian Pacific Agency of the Year award for that, which was pretty amazing. It will, Stoked. I've been working in Bondi Beach for 10 years because, or well more than 10 years now, because it helps me get the balance right. I mean, our work uh, is, we do long hours and you can work from anywhere with our work. You have to get in front of the customer and also our clients, but you can spend a lot of your day down in Bondi. I love to surf, which is why I set myself up down here, so I can surf to keep the mind fresh keep the, the, the soul refreshed and centered and then I can uh, be the best I need to be for, for work. So, I mean, I could do that in lots of other places, but Bondi has a great mix, you know, and I grew up in Coogee and Maroubra, so to me, Bondi feels like home. What do I believe is the potential for innovation in Bondi Beach? There's so much potential. There, there, there's already a lot of very successful uh, innovators and entrepreneurs in Bondi. Um, and I think uh, we, can, we can make that hardwired so that we can create a pipeline for, for people so that we're going through our journey, but let's leave a legacy for new people that are coming into that kind of, uh, that, that journey and that pipeline so they don't have to go through so much of the, the same mistakes so they can um, feel supported and get to where they need to faster. So um, yeah, I think, and what I said before, you know, innovation, sounds like it's always technology but innovation is also about bringing the community forward so i think um, it's very easy to think about all the billions of dollars or millions of dollars that uh, innovation and technology might be might create but let's think about what it does for everyone in the community from a health and well-being perspective as well so to me innovation is about how everyone's standard of life uh, gets lifted so yeah that's that's what i'm pretty passionate about to be honest